as it's supposed to. But uh, hello, everyone. I am Anul Chamju. I am a professor of performing arts technology here at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. One of the courses I teach is called Immersive Media, where my students explore modern extended reality tools and techniques and develop projects at the intersection of musical interaction design and virtual reality. Sound offers many possibilities for immersion, and we're quickly finding out that um, exiled sound is far from reality. Um, but the existing immersive audio design tools can be prohibitively technical. And on the other hand, we want as many students and content creators to deal with this critical aspect of extended reality um, in their work to create engaging um, and immersive extended reality experiences. This is why we designed Inviso um, to explore how immersive audio design can be made more accessible. Inviso started out as a browser-based tool where you can go in and design three-dimensional um, audio environments and export them, import them, um, all works in the browser and you get binaural audio. Um, Inviso has been um, not only used in my immersive media class, but also in many classes in outside and inside of the University of Michigan in K through 12 undergraduate and graduate courses where students use this tool to learn about um, critical listening, psychoacoustics and spatial audio. This has also been used in artistic performances and audio tours. Um, my team and I have developed uh, in 2020 an installation using uh, Inviso. This installation was called Crowdscapes and it allowed the participants of a virtual conference to collaborate remotely on the design of an interactive virtual soundscape to reflect on their life in isolation back then. Um, this installation was awarded the best installation prize at the New Interfaces for Musical Expression Conference, which is one of the leading gatherings in our field. And actually, we are right now watching a scene from that um, installation. This is one of the environments that some of the participants of the conference have designed. I actually want to take a moment right now to jump over to inviso.cc and actually load this very project to show you in action very quickly. So inviso.cc and I'm going to import that very same project that's on my desktop. I'm not sure if you can hear this. I really hope you can. Um, if not, please make sure to check out the app um, after this presentation. But right now I'm listening to a lively environment that uh, participants have designed with objects that have directional sound elements and non-directional sound elements. Um, let me just quickly get out of this for a second. And they've also designed a um, sort of a trajectory for the user so that they can curate what the user experiences as they walk through this particular immersive sonic environment. So Inviso has also been selected as one of the XR innovation projects here at the university, which supported our ongoing work into developing augmented and virtual reality versions of this app. Right now you're seeing one of my students designing a um, a similar environment to what we've seen just now, uh, but in, uh, in virtual reality. Now, we're going to try to give you a little bit of a demo of the upcoming version of Inviso. Um, so let me actually stop this for a second and pull up my browser. I'm right now joined by my student, Tanya Lai, who is a College of Engineering student who has been working on this project and working on the desktop app. Um, Tanya, are you with me? Yes, hi, Tanya is here. Um, she's actually somewhere out in Ann Arbor. Um, the newest version of Inviso 
uh, now allows both cross platform but also cross reality um, uh, operation, which means people can collaborate over the network using um, Firebase. And what this also allows us is to have people from remote locations to join in the same scene from their desk or their augmented reality version of the app to design collaboratively. So for instance, this will allow students to collaborate remotely on designing um, sort of collaborative immersive sonic environments. So Tanya, I'm going to give you, uh, the, oh, I guess I have the room that you're in here. Here you go, okay. If you can all still see this, um, this is me in the middle. Tanya, can you move a little bit? There you go. That's Tanya. Tanya is somewhere else in Ann Arbor. Um, we were planning to have one of our um, collaborators in San Francisco join us today as well, but he couldn't make it. So it'll be just the two of us. I'll just add a few elements in into the scene really quickly. So this is a sound object. Let's attach a sound source to it. Um, here we go. Let's go with speech. Okay. I'm getting a little bit of glitch. All right, I'll try to do this again. Tanya, I was getting a little bit of a glitchy um, sound. So can you join this room instead? I'll just send you the room link. Paste. Here we go. Okay. I think uh, my computer is not liking all this like streaming um, alongside this, but here we go. Okay. Let's try to add a sound object to this. Here we go. Add a trajectory to this sound. And while I'm doing that, Tanya is also editing the scene. You can see that she edited the zone. Uh, she's playing around with the trajectory of the sound source. I'm going to delete the trajectory for a second, um, remove that sound, and then maybe add a um, directional sound object to this. Let's add another cone. Zoom out. Um, and then finally, I want to showcase the AR user working in this. Um, so I'll pull up the, um, the screen share of my iPad really quickly. Open up the app. Pull up the invite here. Zero D eight B Q Y Y. Let's join in. And you should be able to see all the objects in the scene. The edits that we do in desktop will be reflected in um, in the AR version as well. Um, I can delete that object. It's gone. So let's add an AR object here. Um, let's associate a file with it. It's gonna take a minute for that to load on both ends. And then once that does, we can add motion trajectories to this as well. And now you can see the AR um, object we created moving about the space and being rendered in binary audio. Um, you can see the other players in the scene and if you can see me looking around. But yeah, that is about it for our little demo today. I'm giving you a little sneak peek of what we've been working on. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, but that's about it. Let me know if you have any questions. I will quickly share my contact information with you all to wrap this up. Here it is. Thank you so much. I hope you uh, were able to hear it and see it clearly.
Um, great. Thank you. Um, I hope you can share, uh, you can see my screen. If somebody could just give me a shout out for that, that would be great. Okay. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Well, I hope so. Um, so my name is uh, Tara Kim Berman and um, I am from the School of Dentistry. And this is work uh, done by all the faculty at this, uh, the School of Dentistry and students. And um, the question that we wanted to ask was, can VR enhance student learning of head and neck anatomy and 3D radiographic imaging concept? And the QR code will take you to a video that demonstrates our um, our uh, our VR module. So typically, uh, what we do with uh, multiplanar, um, uh, what we do with uh, virtual reality and multiplanar intervention is that when we have our CBCT exam. Um, uh, when we have, uh, when students have their CBCT uh, learning experience, what we do is you typically use a desktop with a computer and a mouse and keyboard. And so they, the students would toggle through three different planes, three different images, and that's how they would uh, really learn about anatomy and interpretation of 3D imaging radiography. So what we wanted to do is to determine whether virtual reality uh, can enhance student learning with uh, CBCT scan overlays uh, using uh, Oculus VR headset and then uh, utilizing that and examining uh, their ability to learn. And so what we really looked at were some learning objectives before we did this uh, research. And we wanted to see if there was increased knowledge of retention and memory we wanted to see if any of the visual spatial skills were improved in our students. And we wanted to do civic engaged and uh, motivation uh, and motivated way for the students. We want the interactivity with the student and the learning environment to be rich. Excuse me. Uh, so let me just go back to screen. Uh, are you? I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Are you able to see the screen? I guess we'll just kind of keep it here. Um, so let's see here. Hmm. Okay. I am sharing, hopefully you can see this. I'm sharing this again with you. Okay, great, thanks. So not only the learning uh, objective, but we really looked at the learning context as well. We wanted the locus of control to be on the learner and that the learner could uh, really kind of uh, direct themselves into exploring the space. It was an individual based context in that the student is really engaged with the, with the learning module by themselves with one-to-one -one teacher or instructor interaction. So the instructor would be guiding the students and kind of pointing out anatomies and answering any questions. The activity le level was authentic in that it is a realistic image of an actual patient's cone beam CT superimposed on the rendered skull. The interactivity level was high in that the student can uh, look through the X, Y, Z planes themselves and choose anything that they wanted to look at. The information was based on an an anatomy information, concepts about CBCTs, looking at different planes, and it was about experiential learning for the student. The way we conducted this uh, study was with three time points. We had a baseline, baseline time point consisting of first-year dental students who had no knowledge of uh, CBCT imaging. And during that time, these 60 students, we were, they were given a survey, they were given a questionnaire, game engine questionnaire that really looked at their level of video gaming experience. 
They were given a pre-test multiple choice question consisting of 10 questions regarding uh, concepts of CBCT and head and neck anatomy. The educational intervention it consisted of about an hour where they looked at some video introduction on uh, how the, um, the module worked, also an uh, uh, orientation of the hardware and the software that they were going to use, and then they spent 30 minutes identifying structures on a one-to-one -one interaction with the instructor. Following that, they took an exit survey, they took another, um, uh, another um, questionnaire called NASA Task Load Index that looked at the physical uh, effort of the uh, participant. We also gave them a presence questionnaire that really looked at immersion and engagement within this module, and then a post-test multiple choice question. These were a similar difficulty level, but different questions. And then at a third follow-up time point in two weeks, we gave them another multiple choice question test. So our sample was first year dental students who had no knowledge of uh, 3D imaging concepts. They did have some gross anatomy. They were split into multiplanar and virtual reality groups. The mean age was about 23. We had uh, both male and female um, disbursement was fairly even, and most had video gaming experience. However, the video game experience was either occasional or rare. The results of our uh, quantitative evaluation on the multiple choice test questions were that students improved by 100%. They doubled their scores for the short term and then for their long term. And this, uh, the recall ability was maintained in virtual reality. However, it was also the same or similar using the multiplanar technique. But so virtual reality module was as good as the traditional, the conventional methods that we currently use. We also recorded these sessions and uh, cataloged student questions during the intervention. And previous studies that we have conducted that were published in virtual reality and journal of dental education show that there was a significant difference in technical questions asked from the VR groups. However, for this particular study, there was really no difference in any of the questions in, as, as whether they were anatomy, technical, application, uh, or clarification questions. The qualitative uh, uh, assessments that we used, though, had some significant differences between the VR and the multiplanar group. Uh, the results were the presence and the NASA, NASA task load index questionnaires. And some of these questions were regarding control factors. Were you able to anticipate what would happen in response to the action you perform? VR group performed um, significantly. They had more um, uh, positive responses to the actions. How much delay did you experience between your actions and expected outcomes? The VR group had less delay. And how involved were you in the virtual environment? The VR group were more positive in these control factor questions. As far as distraction factors, how aware were you of events follow, uh, occurring in the real world around you? The VR group had less distractions. They were less unaware. As far as sensory factors, how compelling was the sense of moving around inside the virtual environment? The VR group scored higher for this one. And for physical factors, it was more physically demanding for the students to be in VR. So the conclusions that we made were that students improved on their test scores by 100%. They doubled their scores, which was maintained in the long term. However, the multiplanar group also show the same quantitative difference. However, students in the VR group had more differences when we looked at the qualitative uh, assessment, including um, that the VR group had increases in uh, the controlling factors or sensory factors and physical factors, and they had a decrease in distraction. And unlike other studies that we have conducted previously, there was no difference in the technical question. So we conclude that the high representational fidelity and richness of user interaction is really imperative for the VR experience. It, you can get improved test scores, but really having these controls, sensory physical factors 
is really important in contributing to the feeling of presence. Our, um, our next steps really of going through this is to now go through more of other things that we do training for. If, for instance, um, uh, 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 psychomotor training and so forth. Again, this uh, research was funded by academic innovations through XR um, in a, in initiatives. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello, um, my name is Rebecca Quintana and I'm the Associate Director of Learning Experience Design at the Center for Academic Innovation, uh, as well as a lecturer at the School of Education. So I'm going to hopefully share my screen. And that looks pretty good. So let's see here. Maybe I want We'll quite do that. Okay, I'm going to work this way. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about using the learner experience to support teaching in XR. Um, I'll be drawing on some experiences in teaching a class about educational applications of augmented virtual reality and really thinking about um, the experience of the student who will be um, interacting with a variety of different technologies throughout a course including um, headsets, so very immersive um, environments, as well as lighter weight uh, types of immersion, such as those that can be experienced through a web browser. So a question that I have is important pedagogical design considerations when we're thinking about supporting students who are learning in immersive XR environments. Um, so I'm thinking about um, contexts in which you know, multiple technologies are being used across a course, as I mentioned. Um, so in the course that I'll be describing today, um, there was an emphasis on social learning. So a lot of the, the tools and applications that we used are um, available widely through the Oculus App Store. Um, so they weren't necessarily um, designed specifically for research context or for um, a particular educational experience, but they were used by by us in the course to create a rich educational experience for the learners. So we used were things like Gather Town, which is not an XR tool, but it is it does have some levels of immersion possible. Social.io, which allows for social interaction, um, Alt Space VR, which we've seen today, um, as well as Engage. So those were applications that students could use together. There were also a number that they could use individually. Um, and you can see those listed there and Frank House, um, Traveling While Black, We Live Here. So we'll move to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, this was a course that um, has been offered through the School of Education. It's a one credit course. Um, it is part of the XR certificate. So those who are here today and are part of that um, might be interested to know that. Um, and in the class, we interrogate claims that are made about the educational utility of XR. And these are some themes that we look at together. So one way to understand the student experience is to, to visualize it through um, what I call visual timelines. So visual timelines are a way that we can represent interactions in support of learning. Um, they allow us to have a holistic view of the uh, learning events, as well as, you know, ways of representing time, uh, sequences of events, as well as um, other aspects of, of space, such as levels of immersion, very immersed, immersed uh, where students have the feeling that they are um, participating in a comprehensive and realistic experience, and then, and then less immersed, sort of um, what you might have through a typical web browser experience. They also allow you to visualize patterns, um, as well as other interesting um, trends. So here's an example of, of one of these that uh, we use to map out our, our course design for one class. Um, you can see sort of the two, two ax axes is there. Um, one is time. So from uh, left to right, you can sort of see how students progressed through a learning experience over two hours, and then immersion from low to high. Um, and what we were trying to represent here is sort of 
various options that we might have given to learners. So allowing them to access um, material through, through a quest, uh, which is very high, high level um, and you know, required a lot of support and scaffolding, as well as providing them with an alternative um, at the same time uh, where they could essentially do the same activity, but through their web browser. So students were experiencing um, you know, discomforts, physical discomfort, or they were having tattoos, um, which is you know, common as well. Um, they always had an alternative. Uh, we would build in a break between sort of the very um, immersive experiences and then follow that by uh, something that puts um, lighter weight in terms of um, um, the technology that we used and always following that, of course, with debriefs. So here's just a little glimpse of the things, uh, the types of technologies that we were able to use. So here's spatial.io. Um, this was the first part of our, our lesson here uh, where students were, were together um, on the lecture on the topic of collaboration. We continued in spatial.io and had students working through a collaborative problem solving activity in an um, escape room type environment, also in spatial.io. As I mentioned, this could be done either through their web browser or through their headsets. Then we had a break. Um, and then would follow that with an interactive experience in Gather Town where students could interact with artifacts, discuss with each other, um, and then debrief as well, with a set of questions here. So all of this to say, um, you know, what did we learn from, from our analysis of, of these different visual timelines? We did them for, for all of the different classes. Um, it was really important to provide students with options so the different levels of immersion um, provided alternatives and also allowed um, in the lower levels, so things like Gather Town or Zoom, for more synergistic creations, things that could happen more, more naturally. Um, but the higher levels of immersion like this, uh, required definitely elevated levels of support and higher levels of scaffolding. But pairing the very high and, and the low levels, you know, as options, alternatives, we feel uh, a more an inclusive opportunity for learning. Um, and then finally, uh, as we sort of looked at the different patterns, um, we noticed that there were structures that repeated, uh, sort of debrief at the end would be one, um, and having this predictable structure um, really helped to sort of facilitate um, an experience that was, um, I guess, comfortable for, for the learners. It was something that they, they came to expect and came to value. So something very intense would be followed by a debrief session. So that's just a glimpse into um, teaching with XR um, and one way to represent the different interactions that 